Well, it's a great pleasure to be introduced as an honorary Singaporean. It's been a great conference and it's, um, there's a lot of hard sell going on, quite subtle at times, about how great individual cities are. Well, I'm not going to talk about my city at all. I'm going to talk about Singapore because, um, to me, it is the international best practice in biophilic cities. So, much of the biodiversity side of things in town planning has been about finding space between buildings or between development. Try and save as much of the city as you can away from development. And so there's an example uh, that's my city and it, uh, it's got a lot of uh, green space that's been set aside and that's where the biodiversity happens. You don't worry about the urban development part of it, um, that's the dark spaces. And this has tended to spread the cities out, particularly in America and Australia. We are very good at sprawling our cities and one of the reasons is we want to have space for nature. And you save a bit of space in between the developments. And that's fine, but uh, there's not a great deal of biodiversity going on in suburbs. It's not actually saving a lot of nature. And a lot of cities uh, have spread out so far, they have engulfed and destroyed a lot of nature. Uh, this is Los Angeles. Um, this is Perth. Um, we, we, you can see little bits of nature left there, but the suburbs pretty much devour it. And uh, you've got a lot of swimming pools and grass. So what can we do about high density areas? This is the, the question now, and it's, it's been the focus, really, of a lot of the attention in this conference. E.O. Wilson came up with this idea of biophilia, that human beings need nature. We co-evolved with nature. So it's not just like it's nice to have nature, we need it. And Tim Beatley, who's a, a colleague that I work with uh, from the University of Virginia, has written this book called Biophilic Cities. He's actually got a grant from the health sector in the US to look at what is the minimum daily dose of nature that we need. Minimum daily dose, like you know, a chemical or so, some particular food. But nature is something we need in our daily life. That means in our buildings, not just kept separate from them. So we have a burst of new creative activity happening in cities around the world along these lines. This is one of Patrick Blanc's wonderful green walls, one in Paris, and the idea has come, perhaps we can landscape buildings themselves. We can do green roofs and green walls and green bal balconies and green edges, and this, in this way, it is bringing biodiversity to the city, but also doing a lot of other things, like air conditioning the city. And in, in fact, Chicago was one of the first cities to take this on because they had a heat wave and they worked out that the urban heat island effect was affecting the city more than climate change. And it was, the, the temperatures were going up quite dramatically. So they had to cool the city, air condition it. So they now require green roofs and there are 600 green roofs now in Chicago. Toronto's done similar things. This is in London, where there's this beautiful wall in Trafalgar Square, green wall. Um, so there's lots of cities beginning this journey and starting to realise that this is a new technology for cities that needs to be adopted. But I do believe that uh, Singapore is the leading city in this direction. So we came here to make a film about it in January and February this year. And uh, this film is 45 minutes long, so I'm not going to show it to you, but I will show a little bit of it because it's pretty sensational. It costs a whole lot of money, $10,000 to make. Um, so you can imagine it's not, you know, Hollywood, but it is 
really exciting to see because the people who are interviewed are incredibly excited about what they're doing. You'll have one of them speaking here shortly. Uh, two of them, in fact. <laughs> and the, the work that national parks here are doing in demonstrating how you can make nature a part of high density cities is amazing. Now, I believe that in future, we'll look on that scene and not only can we see that the canopy cover on the ground covers all the streets and so on, you can't see anything much other than trees there, but in future, you probably won't even be able to see the buildings. That's where we're heading. The city in the garden, in fact, the city in the forest. And you will see examples like this interview with Kelvin Can, who developed a green wall on 136 Cecil Street. Now, this is a building that was abandoned, basically. It was so poorly designed, they couldn't attract uh, people to, to lease the office space. But after he'd done this wonderful green wall, it's like a cathedral, he then built these walkways out into it, dramatically changed the economics of that building. They now have Facebook and Google in there. You don't get much cooler than that. So there we have a, an example of that the economics works, but also it is the, the aesthetics is brilliant. It is just so beautiful. And when you get technology that's not just functional, but beautiful, you know you're winning something. And uh, the greatest example that you can talk about anywhere in the world and people start saying, what? They built a hospital around biophilic principles? KTP hospital? Well, you'll hear from the CEO shortly. But it is a fantastic story and it is demonstrating that you can have a healthier kind of urbanism as well through these biophilics. And on top of it, they have a community garden, so you can grow food in these areas as well. Now, it's only just starting this. There are 400 or so community gardens growing food in Singapore, which you don't hear a lot about. Some of them on rooftops like this. Um, and maybe we'll get one day to doing this, but probably not. It'll only be a, a minor part of cities, but it's an important part nevertheless. The big question I would like to ask and that we need to constantly debate in this is, okay, it's aesthetic and economic and functional and healthy, but is it actually improving biodiversity? And we need to be able to measure that, and that's the kind of thing that it is very important uh, to do the kind of um, biodiversity index that Singapore's doing. And uh, I'd like to see that eventually the high density cities can show us how to do it and we can create biophilic cities in places like the low density cities of Australia. This is actually my street. We've got a gorilla gardener who's taken over the street and started doing these gardens uh, that are covering the a canopy and it's, it's great to see. It does show what can happen. But let me show you the film, just two minutes of it. Biophilic building, what's that? Biophilic cities according to Tim Beatley in his fabulous book, is about bringing nature into the daily life of ordinary city dwellers, which means you have to build it into the way you build the city. And that is new because there's a whole lot of new techniques and technologies with green roofs and green walls and green edges. And we are trying to find the innovative edge in this area. And I think it's Singapore. Now, I had to convince Tim Beatley to come with me, and I'd really sold Singapore. So he's coming for a week. We have to check out a whole lot of case studies, meet a lot of people, do some interviews. It's going to be very intense, and we hope to have a sense of whether Singapore really is the biophilic city of the future. We've got a bit of help. Some of my students, in fact, 35 students from the National University of Singapore who are studying a master's in urban design uh, and they're doing a course with me and Tim are going to help us. And this combination, we hope, will unfold the secrets and mysteries and wonders of Singapore as a biophilic city.
I mean, the ideal thing would be not just city in a garden, but city in a forest. And that would be like the aspirational thing that we want to do. I was actually uh, inspired by uh, the St. Paul's in Notre Dame, uh, Gothic uh, architecture, with the, the amount, kind of the, the grand space that they have. Loving plants is, is the most important thing that, I, that everyone has to do because if you don't love plants, this is going to be the end of civilization. <laughs> I think the most proud aspect of this project is that I'm doing a difference to the patients in creating a healing environment for them. <laughs> oh, of course, that is the main purpose. I mean, to get people close to nature. It's been a terrific week. We've been here in, in Singapore learning uh, about all the amazing things the city has been doing to, to incorporate nature uh, into its design and, and planning and building. And we've, we've had some pretty amazing visits with people and, and projects that show that even in a very vertical, dense uh, city like Singapore, uh, you can have a rich natural world. And it happens in, in lots of different places. It's the, the ground level reserve, it's the canopy that's all around us here along the, the streets, multiple layers. It's, it's on the rooftops of very high buildings and the facades of, of high buildings. And so here in Singapore, this is one very compelling model for how you can have the, the, the urban conditions, the density, and also the nature. No, I didn't, I, I didn't, I don't take instruction well. I didn't realize You can see that yourself, you don't have to buy it, it's on YouTube. So if you Google Singapore Biophilic City, you can get to see it. It's in six or seven different parts or you can watch the whole thing. And you can add to the growing list of people around the world who are discovering about Singapore as a biophilic city. And thank you very much to National Parks for all their help in this. See you.